Blog Talk Radio. Live under daddy's roof, you follow mama's rules. Gotta be a good little girl. Once you hit 18, the light turns green. Wanna get wild on the world. Her and her friends are getting mad. Got their own party pad. Everybody's saying hell yeah. Come on, come on, it's on. It's off the chain, crazy insane. Hugh Billy Potty with the whole damn gang. Flipping out of the news, cutting loose. Cranked out in the yard There's a whole nother punch Drinking moonshine punch To get a little louder by the jar We little innocent child Got them all going wild hey, You can hear them for a country mile Finally singing her own damn song And it's off the chain Crazy and strange You Billy Polly with the whole damn gang Slipping out of the news Cutting loose Raising all kinds of cane Brother, it's off the chain This is up at the Joe Friday Responding to the 415 at 34 Brickyard Road We've also got a 390 and a 314 We've seen parties before But this ain't nothing like It's off the chain, crazy insane, Hugh Billy Potty with the whole damn gang, slipping out of the news, cutting loose, raising all kinds of cane. It's off the chain, crazy insane, a Hugh Billy Potty with the whole damn gang, slipping out of the news, cutting loose, raising all kinds of cane. Brother, it's off the chain. Okay, we surpassed that in the first six months. 
We are starting our second year as of this morning, just the show. Not all the podcasts this thing goes up on, but just on the show at 125,874 listeners. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot tell you how filled with appreciation that my heart is. I knew that there would come a time when I could no longer go and do events because y'all all know my husband is very, very ill. So this was an outlet. And y'all have just blown me away with your support and, and your continued pushing the show and sending me folks and listening in and sharing it. I'm a wordsmith and I'm without words. Now, there's two ways y'all can get on the show. One is you can come on as a guest, whether you're an artist like Jamie Lee, an author like my guest tonight, you have a passion, you're a politician, you have a cause, or you just want to talk for an hour. I don't care. We'll talk about anything. Or you can become a sponsor for the show. Now, no, I don't charge 4 and 5 and $600. I charge $10 for a 30-day ad. It can either be in an MP3 format or it can be in written form, and I'll read it. Now, what I do if it's in an MP3 format, not only do I play it on the show, ladies and gentlemen, but I also put it up. We are now on Reverb Nation, and I put it up on Reverb Nation. If you have a book trailer that you want me to put up there, let me know. I'll put the book trailer up there. It's for $10 for 30 days. Now, however many shows I have in that 30-day period, that's how many times I play your ad. If I have to reschedule a show because, as you all know, my husband is sick, the ad follows the show. So you will get your 30 days. So contact me at offthechainradio at yahoo.com, and I'll give you all the particulars. And speaking of that, we have, oh, in Australia, thank you. Thank you very much. You are our biggest listeners and our biggest supporters, and I appreciate you all very, very much. I have two, three new sponsors. One of them is Jay Traveler Pelton. She has a series of books out called the Oberlin Series. And in 2018, the Oberlins are a shadow family. The parents, Noel and Violet, along with their children, are very close-knit in more ways than one. They all work in the family firm. The children are supposed to take over the firm after the brothers return from their hitch with Uncle Sam so the parents can retire. But things go south real fast when a savage virus is turned loose on the unsuspecting public. Join the Oberlins as they set out to make the world a safer place. J. Traveler Pelton, the author of The Infant Conspiracy, can be found on Amazon, the Oberlin Trilogy. So check her out. She's been on the show before, and she will be back on the show. Also, and again, Australia, thank you very, very much because you made author Diane Moat's Sam Holden series number one in your country. She has a series called the Sam Holden series. The first in the series is called Dog Gone. The second in the series is called Dog Fight. And it goes like this. Wherever a helpless animal whimpers in the dark and wherever the system fails to protect said animal, she'll be there and she isn't giving up any time soon, so you've been warned. When Sam Holden receives a tip about a brutal dog fighting ring, she embarks on some of her most dangerous acts of vigilantism yet. The monster known as the puppeteer circles Sam's world as she unknowingly circles his. And while they chase each other, will Sam put those she loves most in harm's way in order to break up the ring? With time running out and animals in need, the dangerous life Sam's created begins to eclipse any other life she could leave. After the show, go to Amazon and look up Diane Moat, Dog Fight. Start with Dog Gone. Dog Fight is the second in the series. And thank you again, Australia. Also, another author who has now become a sponsor on the show, his name is John Isaac Jones, and he has been on the show. He has a uh, cute little book called Alabama Stories. It's on Kindle, and it's it's a series of short stories from his childhood years in the Cotton State. I have read these stories. And he tells these stories through the eyes of a child, and they are absolutely amazing. Just it, it, you can feel the humidity, the the cotton fields, the the sun beating down on the Georgia, on the Alabama red clay. John Isaac Jones. Alabama Stories. Check them out. Now, we will get to our other sponsors later on this show, but first of all, 
I want to welcome our guest tonight. I have waited quite a while to have this lovely, lovely author on the show. Her name is June Tropp, and she and her twin sister, Gail, started June on this journey. Because when they were six years old, they wrote their first story. It was called The Steam Shovel. It was supposed to have been shovel, but being six years old, you do the best you can. They lived in rural New Jersey, and they got bored. So their brother, Everett, told them to go walk around in their little neighborhood and see what tickled their fancy and write a story about it. Well, the girls did. They went out, and they went on a walkabout, and they found something they wanted to write about. So they came back, and they wrote about it, and then they sold it to her, their brother for two cents. June says, I don't remember how I spent my share. You could buy a fistful of candy for a penny in those days. But ever since then, I wanted to be a writer. As an award-winning middle school science teacher, June used storytelling to capture her students' imagination and interest in scientific concepts. Years later, as a professor of teacher education, she focused her research on the practical knowledge teachers construct and communicate through storytelling. Her first book, From Lesson Plans to Power Struggles, which is put out by Corn Press in 2009, is based on the stories new teachers told about their first classroom experiences, and I bet there were some stories. Now Associate Professor em- Emirate, I hope I said it right, at the State University of New York at New Paltz, she devotes her time to writing the Miriam Bat Isaac Mystery Series. Her heroine is based on the personage of Maria Hebra, the legendary founder of Western Alchemy, who developed the concepts and apparatus alchemists and chemists would use for 1,500 years. June lives with her husband, Paul Zuckerman, in New Paltz, where she is breathlessly recording her plucky heroine's next life-or-death exploit. June, welcome to the show, my darling. Thank you so, so much for spending an hour with me. I'm so excited. I'm so happy to be here with you, Yvonne, and I'm happy to greet your audience and tell them I'm grateful they're there, too. (laughs) Well, thank you. Now, let's, before we talk about your heroine, I mean, I'm biting at the bit to do it, but we know you're the brand, the, the books are just the product, tell the audience about you, I mean, obviously, from the time you were six years old, I can see little June and sis, twin sister Gail wandering around the neighborhood looking for stuff to write about. Was it through a reporter's eye? Was it, tell me how you felt that day, if you can rem- remember, and the path that it set you on. It set me on a path because of the candy. I really had nothing to do that day. That's why my sister and I asked my brother what we should do. He was eight years older than we were, and so he could be like a parent as well. He was our third parent, and he suggested we go around in the neighborhood. But it was getting those two cents, I think, that told us that we had done a really good job, and since we had fun, we could do it again. So did you write more? I was going to say, did you write more stories after that? No, I didn't write much except in response to school assignments, which I really did very carefully and enthusiastically. But I was very serious, a very serious girl in school. I like to read very much. I still do. Part of a writer's life is really reading many things, not just the research you need for your story, but also to see what the current market is like because the market changes as quickly as the hemlines of skirts does. So you read a lot. And I read a lot, but I was very serious in school, and it wasn't really until after I got finished with school that I really opened up to read quite a bit for pleasure. Well, what what made you go into the teaching field? And we talked briefly about your your love of teaching and, and the fact that you use storytelling to engage your students. And, and I told you how jealous I was of 
of not having you for a teacher because I would have learned science so much easier. But what made you go into that field, which not only helped your students, but I'm sure it, it helped you on your path to being a writer? Yvonne, it was something I fell into. I remember I was in graduate school. I wasn't thrilled with the program. And I came home, and my mother told me that there was an opening for a science teacher in the local high school, that the teacher who was there was pregnant. And in those days, Yvonne, you really weren't allowed to teach beyond the fourth month. So the school district was really looking for a science teacher. And even though I hadn't been prepared to be a science teacher, if I agreed to take courses and be mentored by the other teachers in the school that they would hire me. Wow. And and we have just lost um, June. I'm sure she will call back. I don't know why her phone dropped, but it did. So we will soldier on. What I'm going to do while I'm waiting for June to call back in is I am going to play an ad by one of our new um, – Oh, there she is. Never mind. We'll play the ad later. I'm so sorry. There she is. That's okay, honey. It's live radio. Don't worry about it. I was going to play an ad, so I'll just wait and play the ad in a few more minutes because I wanted to ask you the ability that you have to tell stories, to engage your students, was that something that you did deliberately, or was that something that you fell into again once you got into the classroom? I saw that they liked it, Yvonne. They really paid attention, and they really remembered. And I would relate the stories the best I could to their everyday life. So, for example, one day I was teaching a lesson on the relationship between magnetism and electricity. I was telling them the story of Hans Christian Ersted. And I told them, I made up a little bit, that his room was very sloppy and his mother was very angry with him. So when he moved his things to straighten up, he accidentally put a wire that was a uh, he accidentally put a magnet next to a wire that was carrying current, and he saw the magnet moved. Well, I know they all had experiences where their rooms were messy and their mothers asked them to clean it up, so that kind of got them hooked in the story, and they were ready to hear about the connection between magnetism and electricity and how it was discovered. Wow. Oh, my goodness. See, to me, science was boring. It was dry. So I didn't take to it very well. Even though I was curious, it, it was not something that struck my fancy. But if I had had someone like you that wove a story into the science, who knows? I could have discovered a cure for, I don't know, <laughs> anything. It, it did, Because you made it, you engaged the students. You made them part of the story. You made them part of the science. Now, this was, <clears throat> excuse me, these were middle school students. But I do have to tell you, I had an episode that kind of backfired. I no. was teaching a lesson on the alternation of generations in plants, uh, particularly mosses and ferns. It's a very complicated cycle of reproduction, and I wondered how I would get the students' interest. When they came into the classroom, I had the shades down. Typically, they were up, and we looked out onto a small wooded area. But I had the shades down, and I told them they had to be very quiet because... And then I stopped and said, you know, I really shouldn't tell you this. I didn't get a permission slip from your parents, but I'll tell you anyway. I said, the plants are having sex right now. <laughs> well, Yvonne, they ran to the window, 
and some of them actually in their enthusiasm to see what was going on tore the shades down off the windows. And I remember going to the principal that afternoon and telling him that we were going to have to spring for new shades for my classroom. Oh, that is too funny. But you engaged the students. You you got them up and thinking and excited about something and about generation, how, how the plants procreate. And, oh, my goodness, that, can you imagine? I bet your classroom was a hoot and a half. I hoped it was. I hoped that when they came in, they never knew what to expect. I remember when it was Halloween once, and that's typically a very difficult day to teach. The kids are filled with candy and expectations for their own trick-or-treat exploits. But when they came into the classroom, I was dressed in a bathrobe. Of course, I had clothes on underneath. I was dressed in a bathrobe, and I had pasted cotton to my face to make a beard. And then I had hanging from a string around my neck various levers. I told them that I was Archimedes and that uh, I had just come out of the bathtub because I discovered the principle of floating and sinking, the principle of buoyancy. Well, of course, they were laughing at the story, but they got the idea that Archimedes was indeed the one who, we believe anyway, according to story, was taking a bath. When he stepped into the bath, he overflowed the water, and that's how he first discovered the idea of submerged objects displacing their volume and displace and being buoyed up by the force equal to the weight of the water displaced. So that they remembered. I do believe that they could remember it for years and years to come. Wow. Oh, you you just make me excited to want will you teach me science, Jim? <laughs> Oh, that is amazing. I, I just had a picture in my mind, a, a, a video of you dressed in a bathrobe with cotton plastered to your face and let weights around your neck being Archimedes. That is just absolutely fascinating. And, and of course, I'm thinking about the egg dropped in the water, and the, and my first thought was two objects cannot cannot occupy the same space at the same time. So it's just, in my mind, that's the same thing as displacement. Yes, it is. It is. Wow. Wow. See, I'm not as dumb as I think I was. <laughs> Hardly. So let me run a couple of ads, and then let's come back, because I want to talk about the character, before we even talk about your books, well, before we do that, I want to talk about your first book, From Lesson Plans to Struggle Power, because I bet you've got some stories in there about some teachers' first experiences that will make people blush. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Off the Chain. I'm your host, Yvonne Mason, with my guest, author June Torp, and if y'all will hang on, we'll be right back. I'm sorry I cannot talk straight tonight. It's been one of those days, but we will be right back. Horses See Ghosts, a new poetry book by Gannat Wise. It's been called Poetry for the Rest of Us. Amazon. Do you have cougars on your porch swing? <coughs> Are horses your new best friend? <coughs> Do your nicest shoes get buried knee-deep in snow as your toes turn blue? Are you bothered by wolves at your woodpile? No, not that kind of wolf. Join wildlife artist and author Nancy Quinn and her family as they discover an exciting new life in Go West, Young Woman, a true Montana adventure. Available online and in bookstores. Or visit quinnwildlifeart.com for a personalized signed copy. Critics agree, it's a hoot. <coughs> Thank you. 
a struggling city, its beloved baseball team, an antique camera, and photos from that camera that bear an image from the pit of hell, an entity only a select few can see. Journalism professor Buddy Cullen is determined to track this demon down. But who is the hunter and who is the prey? And who will be the next target of mankind's mortal foe? Mortal Foe, available at Amazon.com. Hi, this is Winona and Jade inviting you to join us and our wonderful guests on the And I Thought Women's Cave podcast on Blog Talk Radio to learn more about our books, the And I Thought series, and the Misfit Guides. They're available on Amazon.com and BarnesandNobles.com. Or just to see what your ladies are up to, you can find all of that out on www.andwethought.com. So peace and love from Winona and Jade and our books. <laughs> <laughs> you so silly. silly. You silly. Remember, Did you write that? That's funny. <laughs> Remember to visit us at andwethought.com. And we are back with Off the Chain. I'm your host, Yvonne Mason, with my guest tonight, author, <clears throat> excuse me, author June Torp. And we were discussing June's a science teacher. She's a retired science teacher. And I would have probably given my left arm, which is the arm that I write with, to have been in her class because she used storytelling to engage her students. Now, you, June, you, before we start talking about your character, you wrote a book, From Lesson Plans to Power Struggles, in 2009. And it's based on the stories that new teachers told about their first classroom experiences. What made you write that particular book, and how interesting were those stories? I wrote the book because I noticed a difficulty in teacher preparation. After I was a classroom teacher for about 20 years, I went to graduate school for my doctorate in science education and became a professor of teacher education, particularly in science. But the book that I wrote, From Lesson Plans to Power Struggles, is really for all teachers in grades 6 through 12. I noticed the deficiency in their student teaching experiences. They were being mentored by veteran teachers, seasoned teachers. But the fact was they didn't wear the same goggles in the classroom that the seasoned teacher did. And so if the seasoned teacher made recommendations for them to improve something or change something, the seasoned teacher might not have been aware that the novice teacher was, in fact, unable to do that. That there are stages of teacher development, and the veteran teacher, the seasoned teacher, might not, in fact, be aware of where exactly this ranked novice was at. And so I felt it was important to write the book not only for other ranked novices to see that the, quote, stupid, unquote, mistakes that they were making were really universal. They were universal to being a novice. But also I wanted those who mentored them to refresh their own goggles, relate to those stories of new teachers to be better able to mentor them. So that's why I wrote the book. That's amazing. It's sort of like a roadmap of where you've been so you can so you can relate to where you need to take the new teachers on that journey. That is that is an excellent idea because as as we take the, uh, take a journey in life in anything we do, we forget where we started from and we think everybody should be where we want them to be and it's not always that way. Exactly. And so I collected about 120 stories. Maybe they were about two to 500 words. 
and I found that they fell into categories. The two major categories, and these were all about classroom management, which is a major issue for novice teachers, I found that the stories really divided into two main categories. Problems that the novice teachers had because of lesson planning and execution difficulties and problems that they had with particular students who, for example, might want to be the class clown or who talked a lot, who wanted to be the teacher's buddy, students like that. And so that's the way I arranged the book in chapters, first according to lesson difficulties and then according to discipline difficulties. And so that's where it gets its title, From Lesson Plans to Power Struggles. Power Struggles Between the Teacher and the Student or a Small Group of Students. And I wanted the teachers to be able to diagnose the difference. If the whole class was going chaotic, then the teacher could look toward lesson plans. But if it was just a student or two, or at the most a small group, then there were issues that she was going to have to deal with the student one-on-one. -on -one. And so that's the power struggle issue, and that's what the book was about. That should be required reading for every teacher in every school on every level. I think so, too, Yvonne. And rather than being a story book that is one continuous story, I envisioned it as a handbook that a new teacher would keep on her night table, and if she was having trouble sleeping because of a difficulty she had that day, she could use either the index or the table of contents and zero in on how other novice teachers, some successfully and others unsuccessfully, but with explanation, how they handled the problem, and that I felt would help her go back to sleep. And it also would be a great yardstick for the more travel teachers to go back and review because, as within any job, we tend to get complacent and we need to be jerked back sometimes to the beginning of our journey to go, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Let me try this. Yes. Wow. The book, See, ladies the and book gentlemen, was, why I wanted her? <laughs> the book was really designed for novice teachers, but also for those who mentor them. Wow. And that brings us to the heart of the matter, ladies and gentlemen. This woman has had this character in her head for over 30 years, and I'm just going to let June just run with her because I didn't even know about this person that she based her character on. J June, the person you based your character on, who was she, what did she do, how much is known about her, and why is she so important even today? The character in my book is called Miriam Bot Isaac. But I modeled her after an alchemist who lived in Alexandria, Egypt, during the first century of the Common Era. At least that's when we think this woman, this alchemist, Maria Hebrea, lived. Now, no one knows what her real name was, because the practice of alchemy was a capital offense during the Roman Empire. And so anyone who was suspected of being an alchemist or in possession of alchemical documents would be summarily executed. So being that alchemy was a capital offense, those who practiced alchemy used pseudonyms. They used pseudonyms that were rather lofty first to elevate 
the authenticity of their claims, but also to escape, and perhaps more importantly, to escape from persecution. So no one really knows for sure who Maria Hebrea was. And that left me free to invent her. So invent a life for her. And that's how I came to invent the character Maria Hebrea. Uh, and let me, me, a, let my, me ask you this. My character, Miriam Bot Isaac. For, for those who do not know what alchemy is, will you explain it to them? I'd be happy to. People today tend to think of alchemy as a pseudoscience, as a form of sorcery, because the main goal of alchemists was to convert base metals like copper and iron into gold. And so they were thought of as being on the fringe of, um, on the criminal fringe. But actually, the roots of alchemy are very pure. They were a primitive science. That is, they were an experimental occupation based on a firm theoretical framework, the framework of Aristotle. So while today people might think of alchemy as ridiculous to believe that you could convert base metals into gold, in those days, according to alchemical theory, it was, in fact, possible. Aristotle believed that all of the base metals would ultimately evolve into gold, the highest form of a metal. And so if people, alchemists, could come up with a process to speed up this evolution, then they could, in fact, synthesize gold. They wouldn't have to wait for it to form deep in the earth. So alchemy came to be regarded as even foolishness, a criminal activity designed to fool people, but actually it was based on a primitive science with a theory and an experimental procedure. Now, you have probably used Maria Hebrea's apparatus. You see, we know her best today for the apparatus that she invented. She invented the double boiler. In her experimental work, she invented the distillation apparatus, which students in chemistry still use today, and she invented the double boiler for that very slow heating. And so if you've ever melted chocolate and made a fondue, you've used something that Maria Hebrea invented. It's through these inventions, and really only through these inventions, that we know of her. So when you created your Miriam, you were free to make Miriam anybody you wanted her to be. Yes, I was. I had some limitations. She had to live in the first century, the Common Era, which is when scholars believe Maria Hebrea lived. And she had to be Jewish because alchemy began as an outgrowth of um, Jewish artisans. So she had to be Jewish. She had to be a fervent Jewess. And she had to live in first century Alexandria. Alexandria, it's not an accident that she would have lived there because that was the melting pot of Greek culture. It was originally a Greek city founded by Alexander the Great, who was Macedonian. And then it was conquered by Romans about 100 years before Miriam was born. But it was also a center of trade that brought 
lots of ideas from Asia. So you had ideas from the East, the Far East, the Middle East, from Egyptians, and then the ideas of the Greeks and Romans. It was really an intellectual melting pot, and it was kept that way with certain institutions like the Great Library at Alexandria. So when you... It's making my head spin. So when you started your character, which danced around in your head for 30 years, when you ran across uh, Maria, when you started researching this character and building her story, you had to do research on the first century, on on Alexandria, on the Jewish culture at the time, on Eastern trade. How in the world did you keep it all straight? When I do research, it it makes my head spin. But you have taken this to the outer limits, my friend. I did do a lot of research. I can't tell you how long I did the basic research. But then as I was writing the book, I would find almost each day something else that I wanted to research. For example, in my second Miriam Bot Isaac mystery, The Deadliest Hate, I have a character, an Egyptian cobra. And I won't tell you too much, but it does get loose. And I found that I didn't really know how that class of serpents would move on a very, very smooth marble floor. Miriam is in Severia. She's visiting her heartthrobs, let's see, half-brother. He was her half-brother, and he was a rather peculiar soul who kept an Egyptian cobra as a pet. Now, the Egyptian cobra somehow gets out of its urn at a critical time in the book, And I had to write about how it moved along that marble floor. So that took me right out of writing the book and running to the library to find out how that class of serpents moved. They are different. As a science teacher, I kind of knew that, that their ribs, how they uh, grab their substrate, how they navigate how they locomote that's different from snake to snake so if you have listeners in southwestern United States they've probably seen the track of a sidewinder rattlesnake and that would be very different from a rattlesnake in the east because the substrate is different rather than moving on sand the rattlesnakes in the northeast where I live move on a forest floor or on rock so it's it's a little different so my point is really that I never knew what I was going to research that day and I not only kept notebooks I can't tell you how many dozens of these composition notebooks I kept but then I kept an index of every article which notebook it was in which page it was on, so that I could locate the information very quickly again. So that was an organizational feat, I have to say, to organize all that research. So I loved every minute of it. uh, Yeah, a woman after my own heart. It would be fair to say that not only have you written – amazing novels but you have woven a story that has already got me hooked and I haven't even purchased the books yet and it's filled with educational things it's filled with with things that will that will teach you and you don't even know what you're learning until you finish the book and you go oh I didn't know that which is what storytelling should be about. You have taken your your teaching and put it in reverse and put it into a, a story for pleasure. Yes. The difference is that 
when you write fiction, the story is supreme. The story has to be engaging. It has to hook the reader. It has to challenge the reader. And it has to give the reader a satisfactory resolution. I started writing mysteries because I've always longed for a world with justice. And I have a hunch, Yvonne, you have too, being that you have been a bounty hunter and you've written extensively about true crime. That's really the core of what I know about you. Yes, so you're right. So I see you as being a, a fellow traveler with me in that search for justice, except you are doing it in the real world, and I'm doing it in the world of fiction. I need to see, and I do in a mystery, find justice through my characters. I find justice, that satisfaction at the end. So let's let's talk about the how the books run. Are they standalones? Are they series? The first one you wrote, where you are now, and how far you're going to go with this group of people. The first book is called The Deadliest Lie, and I've written actually five. Four are out. The fifth one is in the hands of the publisher. Black Opal Books is the publisher for the later books. The earlier books were published by... Uh, Bell Books and uh, their particular group of mysteries, Bell Bridge Books. So I've used two publishers. The first books were not as, I'll say, violent. I wasn't, I'm not saying the first two are cozy mysteries because they're not. The second two the Deadliest Sport and the Deadliest Fever have a little bit more violence in them because Miriam is contrasted with her twin brother. You'll see twins in my books. Miriam has a twin brother who becomes a gladiator, and he exemplifies the Roman culture where she exemplifies the Jewish culture. And this was during a time when tension was building up in Judea, not too far from Egypt. The temple was building up the, the, uh, was building up the, the tension was building up between the Romans and the Jews in what's today Israel. And that culminated in the war of the first century starting in 66, but it was really fuming with a lot of hostility. It was a culture war between the Romans and the Jews. The Romans wanting their emperor being recognized as God and the Jews having a God of their own that they certainly didn't want to displace. So that was the beginning of the historical tension and it's exhibited in the third and fourth book. But let me say that the books stand alone. You can pick up any of the books, and then if you like them, continue or go back. But The Deadliest Lie starts in uh, 46 of the first century, and The Deadliest Fever starts in about 60. So there's about a 25-year span in Miriam's life, starting when she's 16, and the fourth book, she's, uh, I can't do my arithmetic very fast these days, but she's in her 30s. So the books stand alone, but they do follow her life, and they follow the course of history, too. So the fifth book, it's part of the the deadliest series, or is it? does it start a new series? 
The fifth book is called The Deadliest Thief, and it's part of the same series. The same core of characters, Miriam, and she has a love interest, and there's a comedy interest, and she has a best friend. These are the kind of the core characters you need to get a story off the ground. But then there are supplementary characters that might consult her because of a problem that they're having, and that might weave into another problem, an even bigger mystery. So she'll have her hook, the book will have a hook, and then the mystery might expand into something far more significant. In The Deadliest Fever, for example, The Deadliest Fever starts with a jewel heist in Ephesus. The temple of Artemis is robbed, and the three thieves, who engineered this heist, end up on a ship to get away. They end up landing in Alexandria. So that's how the deadliest fever ends up taking place in Alexandria, although you have a bit of a visit in Ephesus. So let me ask you this, are you going to, after this fifth book comes out, are you going to continue with Miriam? Are you going to take some of the characters and give them their own spinoff? Or who knows where you're going to wind up? I think your third statement is the best. Who knows (laughs) where I'm going to end up? You know with your imagination that you don't really know until something strikes you. And you say, oh, I'd love to... Write that as a story. And and what she's also researched, ladies and gentlemen, is another one of my favorite subjects, which is piracy. Because y'all know that for a couple of years I've been working on Jean Lafitte. But there was also piracy in the Mediterranean. Yes. It was economically significant at that time. Of course, it may have been significant elsewhere, but my stories and my research is centered in the Mediterranean. So in the beginning, the Romans ignored piracy, pretty much ignored it, with one exception, because they used the pirates to bring them slaves. And so they didn't interfere very much with piracy. The amusing story is, though, that one set of pirates captured Julius Caesar. And when they captured him, perhaps not knowing how important he thought he was, they asked for a relatively meager ransom. And he was rather angry about that. He told them to raise the ransom. And when they sent Jerome for the ransom and got it, he was free. He sailed away. He hired some ships, he came back, and he carried all of those pirates to a city and had them all crucified. So that was the first story I know of where the Romans interfered with piracy, and I think it was because they insulted Julius Caesar, not because the Romans objected that much to piracy. It had an economic impact. They appreciated the slave trade that they got from the pirates. But now, they didn't I appreciate believe... the value of Caesar. <laughs> and he was an <laughs> egomaniac. Yes, he was. So, But I get into piracy because not knowing anything about Maria Hebrea, I did have to make up a history for my character, Miriam Bot Isaac. And so her mother, uh, her mother came from a very well-established family, but they lost their fortune due to too much piracy in the Mediterranean. They lost their, um, the wealth that they were carrying, and they lost their ships. 
so when Miriam's father married her mother, he got very, very little dowry, just a string of pearls. So that's wow. kind of just a little bit of background on Miriam. I brought in the piracy issue. But all these issues that I bring in were, in fact, authentic issues in that time period. Well, you're not going to believe this, but I need for you to tell folks where you can be found because our hour is almost up. Why, well, you're right. <laughs> you're right. Well, if you're but interested you... in in my book on lesson plans to power struggles, I wrote that June Trope Zuckerman, because that's my full name. But when I started to write fiction, my publisher told me that I shouldn't have a last name starting with a Z, that I would be shelved at the bottom. So that's how I came to call myself June Trope. And you can find my website, www.junetrope.com. And from there, you can connect to all the online platforms. You can see book trailers of my books. And you can read a little bit about the time. I run a weekly blog every Tuesday. And if you forget and you don't want to bother with the website, you can get me on Facebook, June Trope Author. I'd love to hear what you think. She's amazing, ladies and gentlemen. She's absolutely amazing. And yes, yes, before y'all start asking, she will come back. She's already told me she was. And June, don't hang up when the show goes dark because i got some things I need to tell you. But I do want to say thank you so I didn't know Caesar was, was captured by pirates, and I've studied Caesar. See, ladies and gentlemen, I'm all the time learning from my guest. I love it. So thank you so much for coming on the show, and I can't wait to bring you back because we have just scratched the surface. Oh, I am so starved. Thank you so for much. This. You are so welcome. I'm so starved for her knowledge, which becomes wisdom. All of you know that there's several things I say at the end of the show, and one of them is this. People will forget your name. They will forget what you look like. They'll forget what you're wearing, but they will never, ever, ever, ever forget how you make them feel. And I know I say this at the end of every show, and I and I hope that I live it. It is very important that I live it, and that is that I want each and every one of you to understand how important you are to me and that every one of you, guest and listener alike, no matter if you're from the States, from next door, or around the world, you are all very important to me and understand that. Also, if you want to achieve greatness, ladies and gentlemen, please do not go out and ask permission because nobody's going to give it to you. You have to just go out and do it, and whether it's to become a garbage man or whether it's to become a rocket scientist. Do it. Don't wait for permission because nobody will give it to you. They don't want you to have it. And don't just feel special. Be special. Feelings are fleeting. They're like changing our underwear. It happens. You have to understand you are special. And when you look at yourself every day in the mirror, say, I am special. I am somebody, and I am okay just the way I am. Tomorrow night, Join us at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time when we have another wonderful, wonderful guest. Go and go to Amazon and pull up June's books. You will not be disappointed. Saturday night we will be here again at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. And I do not have my guest list in front of me because I had a brain cramp and did not write it down because some days I do that. But just join us, share the show, go and get June's books. This is Off the Chain with your host, Yvonne Mason, and my wonderful, wonderful guest, author June Trope. Go and get her books. Learn things, people. Learn things. We will see you again here tomorrow night at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time on Off the Chain. And you know we're always unscripted. Until then, this is, again, Yvonne Mason. And my guest, Hope, wishing you all a very good evening.
Okay, we're off the air, and everything we say now will go up in the archive show. But I did want to tell you that I found your book trailer on YouTube, and yes. I put it on the re, on my Reverb Nation site. So your book trailer is up there. Okay, now I have four. Okay, so well I will go and. I'll, I know. I'll go find the other three and put them up there too. I'm going to put them all up there. Also, tonight's show will to go you. up. There. Okay, tonight's show will go up there as well. But in the morning, well, tonight when we get off of here, and this thing goes up into archives, I will download it, and I will also put the link up on my page, and I'm going to tag you on your page. This is one of my gifts to you. You take this link and share it with everybody. Tomorrow. When I put it up on Spreaker and SoundCloud and Podcast and Podcast.com, I will send you those links. I will also send you the links to the iHeartRadio show that it goes up on and the Reverb Nation site. I'm going to send you all those links, and feel free to share. And thank you so, so I learned so much from you tonight. Thank you, Yvonne. I want to tell you that, I enjoyed speaking with you, and you and your husband will be in my thoughts and prayers forever. Thank you, my darling. That means more than you will ever, ever know. I appreciate it. I do believe that my faith and the prayer of so many like yourself has helped keep him alive as long as I've kept him alive because God does answer prayers, and I don't think it's his time to go yet. I believe you. I believe the same as you. So thank you so much, my sweet one. And I will send you, does January sound good for you to come back? By then your book should be out. You should be started on some more, and we should have a whole lot more to talk about. I would be delighted. And I will send you the book trailers this evening. Okay. And and I, I thank you so much for your enthusiasm, just your beauty as a person, never mind particulars here. You are so sweet. Thank you. You made my week. Thank you. And I will send you dates, and then you tell me which ones are good for you, and we'll get you set up for January, and we'll just have another grand old hour. Okay, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you my much, darling. Yvonne. All right. Bye-bye now. Be well. You too. Bye-bye.